Hello brothers and sisters in Christ, we're going to do another question and answer. Make sure you have your King James Bibles opening and that you're following along. But I got this question uh, under my question and answer video. It says, if you believe in the Millennial Kingdom doctrine, how do you reconcile the final battle with Satan? Okay. I'm going to read lot, all his comments and then we're going to talk about it. Okay. Revelation 20 verse 7, and when the thousand years ha are expired, Turn to Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. i got to remember to pause. <laughs> Let people turn to it. Please forgive me. Um, I love God's Word, and sometimes I get a little excited about it. So Revelation chapter 20, verse 7, it's, it reads, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. The number of whom is as the sands of the seas. Remember this is at the end of the thousand year reign, not at the end, the thousand year reign, when that thousand year mark ends and Jesus ruled and reigned for a thousand years, then this happens. Okay, Satan's let loose for a while. Remember he's in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Verse 9, And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about. So you have people that are against Jesus and the saints, and you have people that are for Jesus which is, are the saints that are there, and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. I always got to explain that. When people say, well, hell is the annihilation and it's the grave and everything. The beast and the false prophet were in the, in the lake of fire. I see the lake of fire, they were in there for a thousand years. Okay? Where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now he's asking, I think this person believes, when we get through this, he believes that there's eternal security in that thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. And I think that's the biz biggest mistake of this. Uh, I hope he's a brother in Christ. Um, but that's your biggest mistake. Let's keep going, because it says usually the, t the teaching is that after Armageddon, all the unbelievers will be destroyed and only the remaining believers will enter the thousand years. Okay? And the one point I had to put in my notes was, remember, the 200 million man or army is destroyed. Okay? Then we come to, that came down with Jesus Christ, remember if you suffer with him, you shall also reign with him. When we come down with them, we're going to be sent out to gather the nations and bring them for judgment before the thousand years starts. So those who have taken the mark and worshipped the beast that did, wasn't part of that 200 million man army, they're going to get cast into hell. Okay? Um, and then there's going to be people who didn't take the mark, but like he said, they, they believe. There's belief in the time of Jacob's trouble. But when Jesus comes back and sets there and he rules and reigns for a thousand years, Jesus is physically present, he's physically ruling, there's no more belief. That's the confusion I get from some of the brethren. There's no more belief in the time of Je uh, in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. He's physically present. But I just want to point that out. The, re the rest are rounded up. Only a 200 million man army does God open his mouth, remember? He comes down. I got a sword in my room sometimes and I like to take it out and, and um, you know, treat it like it's the Word of God. I'll, I'll pretend someone hit me with an attack, <coughs> and it helps me memorize Scripture. I know some of you might think this is pretty, pretty lame, but I'll act like I'm parrying, okay, you know. Uh, if they say, well, the, the King James Bible, there is no perfect written Word of God, and I'll be like, heaven and earth shall not pass away. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And all three Gospels, three of the four Gospels, you know. And it seems funny, but it's just something I do but remember okay we're gonna go out and get those when we come back brothers and sisters in Christ those who suffer with Jesus Christ and we reign with Jesus Christ people some people falsely teach that we're gonna come back and we're all gonna be farmers and we're gonna be working the land and everything no the 144,000 that are sealed and the people that make it through the time of Jacob's trouble, they go into that time period where Jesus is ruling and reigning over them for a thousand years. They're the ones that are going to be working the land. We're going to be ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. We're going to go out there. Jesus says this is the law, and we're going to go out there and enforce it. 
Okay. We're going to be judging. We're going to get to those verses. We're going to be judging people. Okay. Revelation 24. This is what he wrote down. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their forehead or in their hand, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So he, he, he links the verse where it talks about the people that are beheaded in the time of Jacob's trouble that get resurrected for the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ and get to rule and reign along with those of us who have suffered for Jesus Christ in the, what we call the church age, the death of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ. But remember his main question is, if you believe in the millennial kingdom doctrine, which I do, Jesus has not ruled and reigned for a thousand years yet, and it's promised to him. How do you reconcile the final battle? So far, he hasn't disproved the final battle. But like I said, he talks about belief. If there's only believers in the, time, in the thousand year reign, that's his mistake. There's no belief in the thousand year reign. Jesus is physically present. It is even said that during this time the wolf will lay with the lamb, animals will be in peace together and with humans, and all humans will be at peace. That's true. He quotes Isaiah 11.6. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. That's truth. When Jesus comes to rule and reign for a thousand years, there's going to be peace for a thousand years. And we're going to get to that verse. Okay. That's Isaiah 11.6. Okay. And I still need to pause. <laughs> Please forgive me. But remember, you can pause the video and turn to the scriptures. So how can there in turn be uh, believers at the end of the thousand years that Satan could deceive? Like I said, it's not about belief. Jesus is physically present. That's not the problem. We're going to talk about the problem in the thousand year reign. Okay? So do you believe there will still be sin during the Millennial Kingdom? Absolutely. There's still sin in the Millennial Kingdom. My question that I'd ask him, is there eternal security in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, which is we call the Millennial Kingdom because the Millennial is a thousand, and Kingdom, the reign of Jesus Christ. Okay. I would ask this brother in Christ, is, etern is there eternal security in the thousand years of the reign of Jesus Christ? No, there isn't. Mine. You have the 144,000 Jews that are sealed in their forehead so they don't take the mark and they don't worship the beast and they're protected when God's pouring out his wrath on this world for the time of Jacob's trouble. But when they go into the thousand year reign, there's no talking about eternal security for that thousand year period. Their children and their children's children and their children's children and their children's children all the way generation after generation after generation, it doesn't say that they're sealed in their forehead. They're not. Just 144,000. Okay. Turn to Revelation 2, 27. When someone talks, asks this question, like I said, his main flaw is he believes it's about belief and unbelief in the thousand year reign. And there is no unbelief and there is no belief. Jesus is physically present. Okay. I can't say I believe I have a book in my hand. Why? Because I can see it. I know it's in my hand. I'm touching it. It's not, I believe there's a book in my hand. There is a book in my hand. The belief comes in when I say this is the perfect written word of God, King James Bible. It's faith. There's a lot of evidence to back that up, but there's also faith. But saying I have a book in my hands, I believe I have a book in my hands. No. I know I have a book in my hands. I believe Jesus is real. No, he's going to be ruling and reigning physically on the earth for a thousand years. There is no belief. It's a fact. Okay. Revelation 2.27 And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessel of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. Turn to Revelation chapter 12.5 He's ruling with the rod of iron. If everybody's believers, everybody's saved, there's eternal security in that thousand year time period, why is he ruling with the rod of iron? It's not like God is today with his children where he will chastise us with love to get us back on the right track. 
and he pours out his wrath on the lost world. To us, it's chastening. No, he's ruling with a rod of iron. Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with what? A rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Turn to Revelation 19, 15. Revelation 19, 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it it should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. He opens his mouth, sword of the, the word of the Lord comes out like a sword, and just wipes out that 200 million man army. See, people don't realize that when Jesus first came, he came lowly, humble, meek, a lamb. The Lamb of God. He's coming back as a roaring lion. He's going to come back as a lion. That's why Satan likes to counterfeit him. No when it says, be, um, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Satan's always trying to counterfeit, counterfeit Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming back as a lion. He's going to be ruling and reigning with a rod of iron. He's not this tendy, big, fuzzy teddy bear that just gets hugs from everybody. Okay? That's the misconception. Rod of iron. He's going to say, this is how things are going to be, and you obey it. And if you don't obey it, there's punishment. I'm getting ahead of myself, but could there be death in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ? I believe there is. Okay? It's going to be Jesus lays down the law, there is no war, it's all peace. We, when we become as the angels, are going to be the ones out there ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ, enforcing it. Whatever he says is law, we enforce it. We're serving him. And the Bible talks about how we judge the nations by him. We're not our own judge and get to be our own gods. We judge it by him. The King of Kings, the Lord, capital L, Lord of Lords who's going to be ruling and reigning in Jerusalem. Turn to Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. There's going to be people that are fighting him. He's physically present. He's going to be rebuking many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. He shall judge among the nations. Oh yeah. He's ruling with the rod of iron, and he's judging. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. What about us? and that thousand year reign. What are we doing? Are we out there beating, what would we read there? Are we the ones, are we the ones beating our peer, spears into prune hooks and swords into plowshares? No. That's the people that made it through that time period of Jacob's trouble. What are we hoping for, brothers and sisters of Christ? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If, he deny, if we deny him, he will also deny us. If we suffer for him, we shall also reign with him. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. This is where we read about judging. We're going to judge the nations. We're going to judge angels, the fallen angels. They haven't fallen yet. You read Revelation, that when the time of Jacob's trouble starts, that's because Satan and the third of the angels have been kicked out of heaven finally, completely. And if you doubt that, go to the book of Job. I think it's chapter 1. It gets right into it. It talks about how all the angels have to come before God and present themselves. All of them. And Satan comes also. Satan's not an angel. He's a fallen cherub. He's not an angel. Okay? But they all have to present themselves to Jesus Christ. So they haven't fallen yet. Okay? That fall happens when the church age ends. We get caught up. 
And some people teach, and it might happen, we might get up there and see Satan and the third of the angels and, our, and Michael. Okay? And boom, they get kicked out of heaven. And they get come down here. And the time of Jacob's trouble starts. First okay. Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you know, I'm sorry, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? The thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, we're going to rule and reign with him. We're going to have the mind of Christ. God says, here are my standards. Here's my laws. Here's my ordinances for that thousand year reign. And I got to admit, it's not my dispensation. Do I, expl do I understand everything that's going to go on that time? Do I understand how everything's going to be? No. Uh, there's some brethren who have done a lot more studies on it. But the point is, is we shall judge the world. And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life if then ye have judgment of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed among the church, or in the church. I had to put that in there. Least esteemed are the ones that are supposed to be judging. Not the people that have respect of persons, they're famous, or whatever. Less esteemed. But to get back to that, we're going to be judging. You say, well, what's that have to do with what we're talking about? Brother says, Christ, do you believe there's sin in that thousand year reign of Jesus Christ? If we're having to judge people and correct people, then yes, there's sin. What is sin? Sin is going against God, the commandments of God. And if we're judging in that thousand year reign, then we're saying, are you going following the commandments of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is King of all the earth? Are you obeying His command? Are you obeying His command? And we're judging. There's going to be people who aren't obeying the command. So is there sin? Absolutely. Now we're going to get to the death part, but first, here's the big key issue for that thousand year reign. It's happened in the past, it's, happened in, it's happening in the present, and it will happen in the future in that thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Turn to Job chapter 1 verse 5. Job 1 5. Someone can, can follow God's laws outwardly like good works, but inside their heart is a different story. And it was so, when the days of their feast feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned, and cursed God in their hearts. Not openly, not for everybody to see. They look like they're doing great and righteous people. But Job was worried about them cursing God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Remember Jesus, the, the, the rich man. They didn't say he was rich until the end. but the man, I don't have this in my notes. But the man comes up to him and says, What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus had compassion on him and love for him and said, you need to obey, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and keep his commandments for the most part. And he's like, I've done those, you know, honor thy father, thy mother, and love thy neighbor. And he's like, I've done all these commandments from my youth up. What lackest I? And the one thing he told me, he said, sell everything that thou hast and give to the poor and follow me. And the man went away sorrowful, the young man went away sorrowful because he had much he was excited, outward showing. He did all this stuff for the Lord, but his heart wasn't right with the Lord. He was sorrowful about things in this world. I'd sell everything I had and give it to the poor if Jesus was physically here saying, follow me. I'd do it in a heartbeat. But not everybody would. Not every professing Christian to love, back then what Jesus was talking about, the Jews that were professing to love God and, and to obey God, not all of, all of them would have actually followed God. He was right there in front of them. God looks at the heart. That thousand year reign, you got people, I'm going to get ahead of myself a little bit, but you got people, generation after generation after generation, they start forgetting who God is and what God did in the, uh, in the time of Jacob's trouble. 
just like the Jews did with Egypt. Just like we do in our life, brothers and sisters. How many of you did something stupid, God chastened you, uh, convicted you, got you back on the right path, and you've been saved for, let's say, 20, 30 years, and 10 years down the road, you forgot about it. And what did you wind up doing? Making that same mistake again. Because you forgot about the chastening that God did to you. You forgot about what you went through. Okay, it happens. It's not a good thing. That's why we're supposed to hide God's word in our heart. That's why we're supposed to study to show ourselves approved. We're supposed to remember, I'm getting ahead of myself against some verses we're going to go through. You're supposed to remember who you were before you got saved. Why? So you don't resurrect the old man. You don't make the same mistakes twice let alone five to ten times. But, how many people in this world just do what they are told, fearing the punishment of those in authority today? Look at the world today. In that thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, you're going to have people that are fearful because Jesus is ruling with what? A rod of iron. And he's going to have us going everywhere, and God knows the heart. You try. There's no doing something evil in secret. God, Jesus is going to be like, Philip, you have to go over there. Some guy just did something that went against my commands. Yes, sir. And there I go. They're going to be obeying because of fear. Look at the world today, the governments of today that are deceiving and doing wicked things. You've got these people that are blind goats on their way to hell. We tried to preach to them the gospel and the truth that they have a sickness, and that sickness is sin, and that they need a cure, and that cure is the blood of Jesus Christ. And we preach to them the, 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 the crucifixion of Christ, what Jesus went through. They don't want that, but they'll listen blindly to the government, fearing the government, the consequences of the government. There will be people in that thousand year reign that are going to obey Jesus because they're scared. They don't have a love of Jesus Christ. Outwardly and verbally, they're going to be saying, yes, what, what the Lord said to do, I'll do it. But in here, they might have cursed God in their hearts. Not openly, but in their hearts. Why, in their hearts, why am I having to do this? Why do we follow him? Why am I listening to him? And then Satan gets let loose for a thousand years, at the end of the thousand years, and he, he builds on that. A thousand years, brothers and sisters. They, if people live long lives in that time period, that's a long time to hold a grudge, <laughs> you know, in your heart. I still believe there's going to be death in that time period. But I don't know if it's going to be because of old age or if it's going to be because of punishment. Jesus is ruling with the rod of iron. I, I give up. I'm not doing what you tell us to do, Jesus. I don't know. It's a different dispensation. But I do know death is still there. We'll get into those scriptures in a minute. But remember, it takes only a few generations to forget what God has done for the people in this world. Turn to Titus chapter 1, verse 4. Remember, thousand years. You have the 144,000 that are sealed in their forehead that start the thousand years, but then they have children, and then their children, and they pass on the story about what they went through in the time of Jacob's trouble, and they pass it to them, and they pass it to the next one. And what happens? Eventually it becomes like a fairy tale. Now remember, Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning. Remember in the Old Testament, the Jews would have the Sabbath day, they'd read about the exodus out of Egypt, and they'd read about the laws and Levitical laws and everything, and they still failed the Lord. And they're reading it every day. Why? Because that exodus out of Egypt, the farther they got away from it, the more it felt more like a fairy tale than truth. And they forgot who God was, and they forgot what God had done for them. I believe the same thing is going to happen in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Titus chapter 1 verse 4. To Titus, my own son after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. For this cause lift I thee in Crete, left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and order, ordain elders in every city, as I have appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry. There's a good one. Not soon angry. You can be angry with a cause, but you shouldn't be so quick to get angry. Okay? Not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. 
but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I, I'm, I, I think I ate something poison. <laughs> what is it? Bad food. Sometimes I fall into the trap of um, eating food thinking, well, it could be on the verge of going bad, but I don't want to waste food. And I ate some meat that kind of went bad. So I had some food poisoning for the last couple weeks, and it's really been bringing me down physically and spiritually. And I remember talking about this. I'd love to have a house church. I'd love to, you know, even if it meant someone else preaching and I'm just there to help and support, I'd do it. Okay, why? Because the lover of good men, I'm helping out neighbors and I will still continue to help out neighbors till God calls me home. I've preached the gospel to them. I've given them gospel tracts. I've given them all my neighbors. The book that Brother JT did, How to Be Saved and Know It, because half the neighbors around here claim to be Christians. Um, and when you sit there and talk to them, they hate the King James Bible, want nothing to do with the King James Bible. But brothers and sisters of Christ, and you feel it too, we want to be around good men. We just feel like, and there's no better men to be around than brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, the Bible talks about how we, we be holy as I am holy, and the lost world says, oh, you just think you're holier than, I, than we are. We're supposed to be as Christians, okay? We have the Word of God. We want to be around good people, good Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women, helping one another out, praying for one another, testimonies. I, I used to get emails for testimonies, and I got a testimony in the email yesterday. Praise the Lord. I'm still going through it. Um, but prayer requests and testimonies, you know, people Skyping, um, doing our best, being so spread out, but still having that face-to-face -face talking. Okay? But we being lovers of good men. You can always tell something about a man that claims to be a Christian by the people that he spends most of his time with. I spend most of my time alone or making Bible study videos for you brothers and sisters in Christ. It's my way of spending time with you. Okay? But you look at these Babel buildings and it's the cult of personality. It's me going off on a tangent. I don't want to get too far off on the study on a different thing, but I just underlined it because it's so important. A lover of good men. Sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, the Jews coming in. Got to keep the law in order to be saved. No, we have liberty. No, no, you got to keep the law in order to be saved. You got to keep the holy days and the Sabbath days. You've got to keep, uh, you've got to be circumcised. You've got to be, you've got to eat only clean meats, and during certain festivals, you have to eat meat. Okay? we got liberty, but they were coming in the circumcision. The unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. Money. Donation, you know that big teach, false teaching? You have to give 10% uh, of your tithe, 20% of your tithe, depending on what story they try to go off of in the Old Testament. Right? You've got, they're forcing people to, you have to donate money. The Bible says you're supposed to give out of a uh, cheerful heart. But why are we going through this? Remember, you have it listed out of a good man with good works and how he's supposed to be, and now it's talking about bad people. Verse 2, 12, and they all try to claim to be the same people. Well, we're all Christians. You're a Christian. I'm a Christian. We're all Christians. Verse 12, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cre Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. We see that going around a lot and false Christianity. He to Jewish fables and commandments of men. Where's the we go chapter and verse? They couldn't pull it out of the Bible to save their life. And they turn from the truth, the word of God. Verse 15, unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. And here's the key verse, I wanted to read the whole thing. He's talking about a good person, and then he talks about bad people, the contrast. Verse 16, 
They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and here it is, and unto every good work reprobate. You mean people can put on a show and do good works that line up with Scripture? And they're reprobate? Remember what he just said there? Nothing is pure. Even when they do what the Bible says they're supposed to do, if they're lost today, if you're lost, false convert, all the good works are worthless. They're reprobate. You're still going to hell to burn for all eternity if you refuse to repent, true biblical repentance godly sorrow for per your personal sins that you've sinned against him. It's not going from unbelief to belief. That's a lie. That's a lie that this world loves to hear so much because it helps them justify staying in their sins and not really throwing their sins at the foot of the cross. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, the blood that was shed was God's blood, and what Jesus went through, I should have gone through. Okay? You don't get saved. All the works you do that line up with here, because they all, I know today they all won't. God will show you there'll be big red flags. Red flag here, red flag there, red flag here. But in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, they're going to be commanded and it will be enforced that they do the good work that Jesus commands in that thousand year reign. But good works can be what? Reprobate. They can be worthless. Why? Because of their heart. Remember about Job. They might have cursed God in their hearts. What does God know? God knows the heart. This is where conversion happens, not up here. True conversion happens down here in the heart. I had a brother tell me once that you can miss heaven by 13 inches. You have the head knowledge. You want to be part of your group. You like this, this gospel over here because it lets me keep my sin and live like the world and look like the world. You have the head knowledge of Jesus Christ and what he went through, but it never makes it down to the heart. It's a heart matter. Salvation is a heart matter. You come to God broken. God knows the heart. Turn to Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. So good works can be reprobate. He lines out a good man. He lines out bad men. And then he talks about how it doesn't matter if they have good works, nothing is pure with them. They don't have the blood of Jesus Christ on them, washing their sins away. Remember when you get saved, your past sins are all washed away. And from the moment you get saved to the catching away of the body of Christ, anytime you sin, you need to repent, forsake, and get it under the cross. God is faithful to forgive okay, us as sinners as a saved sinner too. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. A thousand year reign. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me that that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And thy name hath cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Good works. Those are all good works. What does Jesus say? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. God knows the heart. Now I know in that time of Jacob's trouble, I put down on my notes, I said, where are the bad works mentioned here? Look at all this good stuff we did for you. We didn't take the mark. We didn't worship the beast. Look at all these good works we did from you. But they don't mention the bad stuff. There are some of them that will take the mark and worship the beast and still try to try to talk their way out of it that weren't part of that 200 million man army. Okay? Yeah, but I did all this for you and I did that. I mean, it's, I, I might have taken the mark and I might have worshipped it. They don't mention that. All they mention is all the good works that line up. But Jesus still says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. And that thousand year reign, God allows... When that thousand year reign comes, it ends that thousand year period, God's going to separate the goats from the wheat. That's why he, for that thousand year period, He's going to separate those whose heart is really for Him and those hearts who are secretly, that God knows, that are cursing Him in their heart. Cursing God in their heart. And He's going to let Satan loose for a little while to round up the ones that aren't His. 
to separate. That's why he says they, they surround the saints. There's saints in that time period, and there's people that are fakes and frauds. They are only talking about good works in that passage, yet Jesus treats those good works as though they are reprobate. And he sees right through them. Just like he will at the end of the thousand years reign, of his thousand year reign. What we call the millennial kingdom. He'll see right through them. That's why he lets Satan loose. Almost like he's giving them another chance, yet Satan, he lets, that's how God is. He's long-suffering and not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's been that way from day one to now. Salvation has not been the same since day one, but that, that verse there has been the same. He, think about it. He, can just, he knows those people's hearts. He can just kill them right then and there. But he lets Satan loose to tempt him like he's giving him another chance. God gives us opportunity after opportunity. In this life, there's nobody that's without excuse. God gives us opportunity after opportunity to get saved, to come to Him, to be born again, to have everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. He gives people every opportunity opportunity after oh, I hate using the word chance because it makes you think of like gambling but opportunity after opportunity after opportunity Peter Ruckman once did a teaching that I like talks about roadblocks there's a million roadblocks that you have to avoid and ignore telling you you're on your way to hell you're on your way to hell here's another roadblock there's another roadblock here's another roadblock you've got to go through a million of them by the time you get to hell you're without excuse God gives us a lot of chances. Now, real quick, let's talk about what I kind of jumped ahead a little bit when I said, but 1,000 years of children with free will, free will, and no internal security. There is no belief in Jesus Christ. He's physically ruling and reigning. Turn to Exodus chapter 1, verse 8. Remember, over time, generation after generation after generation, people start to forget. They start to forget who God is. I've known Christians that I believe are saved that they started to forget who God is. They forgot to fear God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Okay? They start losing that knowledge and they start feeling they stop fearing the Lord. And then you get chastised, something big happens, you make a huge mistake, and God, the fear gets put back in you just like that. Okay? But you forget. This lost world is forgotten. The countries are forgotten. The ones that used to fear God, they don't fear God anymore. That's why America's falling apart. They don't fear God anymore. The other countries, Great Britain, they don't fear God anymore. Exodus chapter 1, verse 8. Now the... Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when they were, when there fall, falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us. And so get them up out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, pythons, and Ramesses. You say, well, why are you bringing this up? Do you remember what jo um, Joseph did for Egypt? God had a set plan for Israel. The name's no longer Jacob, but Israel. To save Jacob, his 12, the 12 tribes. The, what's going to be Israel, the Jewish people. Brought them in to Egypt to protect him. But what did God do to Pharaoh at the time through Joseph? He made Pharaoh rich. He made Pharaoh great. He saved Egypt. They, if, if it wasn't for Joseph, Egypt would have perished. What happened? If this Pharaoh would have remembered Joseph, you think he would have treated? Remember, there was Pharaohs before this and Pharaohs before this. You had Joseph, that Pharaoh, then a Pharaoh, 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 so many Pharaohs, and then you get to this Pharaoh that knew not Joseph. The Pharaohs that did know Joseph and remembered Joseph, not that they knew him personally face to face, but they knew of Joseph, 
the Jewish people got treated right. What happened? Came to a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. What happens in our life as a Christian? Do we forget sometimes what the Lord has done for us? With about the Jewish people, time and time again, they keep forgetting about what happened in Egypt, what God did in Egypt. And it didn't take long for them to forget either. That's why they had to do the 40 years in the wilderness so the old would die and perish and the young would come up and then they'd get another chance at the land that God promised them. They kept forgetting all the great wonderful works that Jesus did like that. Deuteronomy 6.12, you don't have to turn here because we're going to go through some of these fast. Just three of them. Deuteronomy 6.12, it says, Then beware lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. It's a warning. Don't forget the Lord. Deuteronomy 8.14, 8, we read, Then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Not to forget the Lord. That's why the Bible says, today, brothers and sisters of Christ, we're supposed to give God thanks and everything. It's hard to forget the Lord if you're giving Him thanks. I give God thanks every day for everything I have, almost every day. And sometimes it's individual, because I just want to talk to the Lord, and I just want to show Him how thankful of. I look at everything I have on this deck, and I just start saying, thank you for that, thank you for this, thank you for the view, thank you for the beautiful day, Lord. Thank you. You give God thanks and everything. Why? So you don't forget the Lord. We give God glory in all things. Why? So you don't forget the Lord. Jesus is going to be physically present on the thousand year reign, and there's going to, people, going to be people in that time period, and towards the end, they're going to forget who He is. God Almighty. The Lord God Almighty. Deuteronomy 9 7 says, Remember and forget not how thou provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt until ye came unto this place, for ye have been rebelled against the ye have been rebellious against the Lord. Remember what I said, in our life as a Christian, how many of you have been chastised for something that's been saved for a good while, and then a few years later, ten years later, you make the same mistake on accident. And you stop and you look and go, why did I do that? Because everything just all the memory comes flooding in, or when you made the mistake before, and if it got to the point where God had to chastise you or really convict you. You're like, why did I make that mistake again, Lord? I'm so sorry. What happens? Chances are you got complacent and you forgot the Lord and who He is. That fear there kind of dwindled away. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. Say, so what does this have to do? The time of Jacob's trouble. I mean, the, time, the thousand year reign after the time of Jacob's trouble, the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. There's free will, there's a thousand years, and those people aren't saved by belief. And I think, like I said, that's the biggest issue here. But there's a lot for us to learn from that question about that. Why do they turn against God? Because they forget who He is, they forget what He's done for them. Ephesians chapter 2, 12. We're not to do that either, brothers and sisters of Christ. We're supposed to remember the cross. We're supposed to remember that God saved us. A dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner, Philip Newton, God saved me. Don't forget that. I keep telling myself, don't forget that. Remember the old man. Don't let him be resurrected. Remember, the old man is dead and buried with Christ. The new man is raised with Christ. That's why I preach that no changed life gospel is a resurrectionless gospel. There's a lot of people out there, easy believism, there's no, re there's no new man, no new creature in Christ, and with the lives they're living, there's no resurrection. They deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ with the life that they're living. They're fakes and they're frauds. But to those of us who are saved, the changed life is there, and we remember the old man. Ephesians 2.12 that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Holy Spirit in us. We were godless, capital G godless. I know some of the Gentiles had false gods, lowercase g gods. But having no hope, 
Brothers and sisters Christ, we talked about the third salvation being caught up, that blessed hope. Now that we were saved, we have that hope. But before, we didn't have it. We were, we were hopeless. But now in Christ Jesus, you were sometimes, you who were sometimes far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made bo both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in the, his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Liberty. For to make to himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off. Praise the Lord. And to them that were nigh, Gentiles, far off, them to their nigh, the Jews. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. i got to make this comment. If you're saved, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither, okay? If you're saved, if they're to the lost world, they're still Jews and they're still Gentiles. There's still a separation. God's not done with the Jewish people yet. When you get saved, when it comes to that adoption, there's neither Jew nor Greek. Verse 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the buildings fit framely together, grow, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, the body of Christ. We're so scattered today, and it seems like we're, we're, we're falling away from each other, and we need to be coming together. Not falling away. And whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Remember that in times past, that it, that go back to verse 12, that at the time ye were without Christ. We're to remember that there was a time that we were not saved. Okay. Okay. There was, I don't have the verse down, but one time it talks about you forget how we treat the lost world as far as how we address them with the truth. We're not supposed to yell at them as far as losing our temper. Remember, slow to anger. We're supposed to be temperate. We're supposed to be meek. We're supposed to be peaceable. We're supposed to be preaching the plan of salvation to the lost world. But we're not to look at the lost world and go, man, that guy or that woman over there, they're just so filthy and so wicked. Uh, they're behind, beyond hope. And you just go the other way. No, you preach the gospel to them. Why? Remember, he saved you, brothers and sisters in Christ. He saved me. How bad was I when, before I got saved? I was horrible. I'm glad that person that led me to Christ didn't have that attitude. Oh, that man, he's just so far gone, I'm just going to go this way. And I didn't put the verse down. So, But, Brother Jesus Christ, we're supposed to remember who we were before we got saved. The old man. Okay. People forget the Lord. They forget who He is. They forget to fear Him. They forget what He did for them. That's why today, Brother Says Christ, it talks about the falling away. What's this falling away all about? They start forgetting the Lord. In these last days, there's a lot of people that don't know this book like they should know this book. King James Bible, God's perfect written word. And what happens is, they stop fearing God. They start forgetting what God has done for them. Starting at salvation and everything else He's done for you in your life. They start forgetting that. And what happens? They start falling away. Uh, they forget their life before Christ, the hardcore sanctification that comes after salvation. Like I said, everything that God's done for you after salvation, they forget it. All the sanctification, all the close calls. There's a lot of times God saved my life multiple times. Okay? As a saved sinner. I'm talking about physically saved my life. Okay? They start to treat the brethren like the enemy instead of sin, of sin and that which is evil. I put this down. You don't have to turn. You don't have to turn here because I don't want to go too far off on a tangent. But Second Thessalonians three thirteen says, "But ye brethren, be not wary in well doing. And if any man obey not our word with this epistle, note that man and have no company with him. 
that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Some people forget about them, the mistakes that I've made as a Christian, and they forget about their lost life when it comes to preaching the gospel. You got a brother in Christ, don't treat him like an enemy. I see that happen left and right. You forget the mistakes that you've made as a Christian, and you start getting on it what they call the high horse, that pride, and you start looking down at other Christians that are making mistakes. Okay? So there's times where you might have to break fellowship temporarily until that person gets right with the Lord so you have a door open for them to come back. Don't, don't let it get that high up, okay? Ephesians 4.22 says that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Okay, we're supposed to remember who, what we were like when we were lost. We're supposed to remember the mistakes that we made. When God was sanctifying my life, the first couple years I was saved, it was a hard couple years. God had to get a lot of sin out of my life. He had to change my way of thinking because I've been so deceived by false religion and everything. He had a lot of work to do on me. So if you see a babe in Christ that's struggling with sin, have some grace. Okay, Follow the scriptures and everything. But here's the, going back to the main study. But here's the key for that thousand year reign. My other question I'd ask him about other than eternal security being there, I'd ask this brother in Christ, I said, do you think there's death in that thousand year reign of Jesus Christ? Okay. This also proves it, okay? 1 Corinthians 15, 56. Go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 56. One more verse after this and we're done. Sorry if this has taken so long. I love the word of God and I love the brethren, okay? Remember, this thousand year reign is not my dispensation, but we will come back and rule and reign. If you suffer with Jesus Christ, you shall reign with him. And we're going to go out there and judge the nations. God sets the standards. We have the mind of Christ. Jesus is God. He sets the standards. And we go out and enforce him and judge the nations. But 1 Corinthians 15, 56 says, The sting of death is what? Sin. And the strength of sin is the law. Okay? And that thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, it's works. Salvation is going to be based off of works, not faith. But we see here the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. When did sin enter the world? Well, Satan was the first one to sin. Okay? But when did sin enter the world? Not the universe, not the heavens, like the th third heaven, the second heaven, and the earth, first heaven, and then the earth. We're talking about the earth. Satan came down and tempted at Eve, and Eve, uh, Adam chose to sin and die with Eve. That's when sin entered the world. What also entered the world when sin entered the world? Death. Has death been done away with yet? Turn to Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. When is death going to be done away with? No more death. Oh, that happens when Jesus comes back at the end of the time of Jacob's trial. That's not when it happens. When does it happen, brothers and sisters in Christ? Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book according to their works. I like to note this, if you note, remember this passage and where we started, it's the whole start of this thing. Just before a little bit, 27. That's when Satan is let loose, deceives the nations, get them to turn against God, and then he wipes them out. And then what happens? The great white throne judgment. Okay. Verse 12. And I saw the dead and small great stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book, the dead, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell were delivered up to, up, hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And here it is, verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The second death. Death hasn't been done away with until this moment right here. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. 
Once again, this happens after Satan goes out and deceives them. If there's still death in that thousand year time period, there's still sin. Okay, we read that there. The sting of death is what? Sin. But the strength of sin is the law. Sin entered the world, that's why there's death in the world. That's why people grow old and die. Okay, like I said, I can't be 100% sure on whether people are going to be killed for not obeying the Lord, because he's going to be ruling with a rod of iron, or are people are going to die of old age. It's not my dispensation. We'll all have the mind of Christ when we go get caught up, which I'm looking up because, like, could it be right now? Pray that it happens shortly. Uh, we want to get that last soul saved. But death does not, death and hell does not get cast into the, the lake of fire until the great white throne. The old heaven and the whole or old earth is destroyed. Great white throne. Then we have a new heaven and a new earth. There is no death from that point on. There is no sin from that point on. But the biggest thing is that the biggest push to prove that how can you reconcile? I mean, part of this was like, what is he really trying to say? But how do you reconcile? How do you reconcile it? They have free will in that time period. Jesus is ruling with a rod of iron. There's still sin. People are forgetful. They forget the Lord and what he's done. Okay. So let's go back to the first question that was asked. If you believe in the Millennial Kingdom doctrine, and I do, how do you reconcile the final battle with Satan? Simple. There's no eternal security in that thousand year reign. And I know we kind of beat around a little bit, but I really wanted to push this preaching, Brother Jesus Christ, that don't forget who God is, to fear the Lord, don't forget what He's done for you, don't forget what He's capable of. But in that time period, the reason Satan's able to deceive those people is because there's no eternal security and it's not belief. There is no belief in that thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. It's all works. Works. Okay. So, hopefully this has encouraged you, Brother Jesus Christ, to remember what Jesus did for you and continue living for the Lord every day. But to answer this person's question, trust the book. Somehow someone came along and told you, well, this isn't going to be this or that's not going to be that when it comes to the thousand year reign and tries to steal your belief in this book. There is going to be a thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. And at the end of that thousand year reign, the whole thousand years, it's not about belief. The belief was talking, when it talks about belief going into that thousand year reign, it's talking about the people who believed in the time of Jacob's trouble. Not during the thousand year reign. Jesus is going to be physically present. Okay. So, grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.